Great. So we are in the, uh, in the book of Colossians, and we are in part three today. And the, the central, or one of the central messages of this book is that Jesus is enough. Um, we saw in the first week, Jesus is enough. We saw that last week as well. And, and um, this message continues this week as we're in part three, that Jesus is enough. And, and this week, we're looking at the area of family, this very important topic of family. And um, when I think of family, I realize that some of the, some of the deepest uh, pain that I have caused uh, to, people, uh, to people in my family um, through things I've said or, or things I have done, uh, things that I've kind of cut to those that are dear. Uh, and, and maybe as you think about your family as well, you can think of, yeah, I've, I've done some things, I've said some things that have, that have been hurtful in this area of, of family. And by the grace of God, and really only by the grace of God, we can, we can forgive, we can restore, we can be reconciled, we can be healed. This, this morning, uh, one of the songs we, we sang was uh, speaking about uh, let the healer come and, and heal us. Let the healer come and set us free. And, and really, Jesus is able to do that. Uh, Jesus is enough in this area of of family, and and I, I really pray and hope that we will get a sense of of that reality this morning, and we'll leave here encouraged, uh, leave here with hope, and even leave here having uh, God touching our hearts. I think He's already touched us even during the time of of, of worshiping Him through through song. Our passage this morning is is Colossians chapter three, um, and the passage is about the household, this idea of the household. And, and, and if you think of the household, it's quite key for us who live in Da because it's not just the, you know, mom, dad, and, and, and kids. You know, there's extended family. There's also those who work for us. That's a big part of this passage. You know, we've got dadas and askaris and, and uh, gardeners and so on. We're not going to go there for the sake of time, but I'd encourage you uh, in your own time to read the whole chapter because it speaks of this household idea uh, in that holistic way. So if you have a, a Bible, uh, please turn with me to uh, Colossians chapter 3 and we'll be reading verses 17 to 21. Just to remind us of the context in chapter 1, uh, we saw that Jesus is fully God. Jesus is fully God and that all things were created for him. Uh, Jesus is God who took on flesh. We saw in chapter 1 that through his blood that was shed on the cross, all things can be reconciled to God. So Jesus has this ministry of reconciliation. He, he can reconcile us one to another. He also reconciles us to God. Uh, chapter 2, last week, uh, we, we see that our lives are now in Jesus. There's this theme of being in him. And because our lives are in him, uh, we do not live by human tradition. Uh, we do not live by human commands and teaching. Uh, we're not just into going through religious motions. We live because we are in Christ. There's a living relationship with God, and, and that's what we have. And we, we don't seek out supernatural experiences because Jesus is enough for our relationship with God. As we get into chapter 3, the emphasis is, is not so much on our relationship with God as it is on our relationship with each other. And it hones in on real day-to-day -day life. Jesus is not only enough for our relationship with God, he's also enough for how we live out our relationship with each other, including our relationships with each other, including in the area of family. So let's read from verse 17 of Colossians 3. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, 
do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. I think it's quite striking that this passage addresses all these different groups, and I'm trying to imagine um, where they all sitting in one place. There were some fathers there, there were some mothers there, there were some children there, there were wives and husbands, and, and as this letter is being read, uh, you hear what is addressed to you, your specific part. If you're a father, okay, that's for me. If you're a child, that's for me. But you're also hearing what is being said to the other groups as well. So you don't zone out just because that wasn't said to me. It, it's, it's building the whole, the whole family. After all, they are one in Christ and they need to work out what it means to be one in Christ. Our passage begins with this verse 17, which says, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And this verse, it's actually a bridge between the things that have, have just been said. Where Paul had been saying, this new life in Christ is to be lived with compassion, is to be lived with kindness, it's to be lived with humility, it's to be lived with patience, it's to be lived with forgiveness. So do all of these things in the name of the Lord Jesus and do them with thanksgiving. I'm grateful for this life I have in Christ and, and I'm going to live with compassion and love and understanding and so on and I'm going to do it with thanks. Giving. And, then, and then it builds this bridge into what we are looking at this morning. So whether it's marriage, and if you're not yet married and you're thinking of, of getting married, hey, tune into this. This is for you as well. Uh, whether it's parenting, if you're not yet a parent, uh, don't tune out. This is for you as well. Whether it's being a child, we've got some of our kids in here. Um, whether it's parenting, um, yeah, all of these relationships, do all of these things in the name of the Lord Jesus and do it with thanksgiving. Because Jesus is God, as we've said, and we were created for him and our lives are in him and we've said Jesus is enough, then marriage and parenting and being a child, all of these things should be done in his name. Right? That, that's what Paul is saying. All of these things, do them in the name of our Lord Jesus. Now, what does it mean to do it in his name? Well, it means to do it in a way that represents Jesus well. As, as you are a, a, a parent, well, parent in a way that represents Jesus well. As you're a child, be a child in a way that honors Jesus. That's to do it in his name. And then Paul goes on to tell the Colossians how they are to live out these different family relationships in a way that honors Jesus. And he begins in verse 18, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. For wives, living in a way that represents Jesus well meant submitting to their husbands. To submit means to willingly Put yourself under the authority of your husband. To submit means to willingly arrange your life in an orderly manner under the leadership of your husband. Men and women are both created in the image of God. We are equally created in the image of God. Another thing that can stand in the way of submission, and this, this is related to the whole upbringing thing, is cultural influences. Culture does not stay the same. So if, if you go to the place or the, 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 the cultural, uh, geographically, if you go to where Paul was writing this now about submission, it probably doesn't look the way it did back then because culture tends to change over time. And as culture changes, 
some of the things that culture presents will come into conflict with some of the timeless truths that the Bible presents to us. Now, the, 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 the truths of the Bible are timeless, but they are applied in a cultural context. And it's interesting how much culture can influence the way we process what the Bible has to say. So we might actually now be in a situation where we say, you know what, the culture of today doesn't agree with this. So we elevate culture above scripture. So take, for example, uh, feminism. Feminism is something that is in the culture. And, and at, it ex at its extreme, feminism would say something along the lines of, well, whatever a man is, a woman is also. So in marriage, a man and a woman should not only be equal in value, good, that's a biblical truth, both created in, image, in the image of God, but they should also have equal roles, equal authority. And that's like, that's not what the Bible says, but culture may say that. Another thing that would kick against this is the reality of our sinful nature. You know, we're sinful. And, and what sin does is it rebels against God's ways. It's like God says this, my pride, my, my own desires say no. I'm not going to line up with God's word because we're sinful. And pride makes us struggle with submission. So we need to deal with these things. We need to receive God's healing from the bad experiences. We, we need to experience light of God's word. We need to examine our culture in the light of God's word. And where we have sin, we need to repent of our sin so that we can live in a way that God calls us to. Men were designed to be um, respected. That, that's like in the and the way God made them, in, fundamentally the way God has set up a man is that he, he longs to be respected and, and honored and followed. That's, that's just in the way God, God's made men. So, uh, you know, when, when we think of this, it's not like, well, over time men have changed. They don't really need this. They're still the same. <laughs> this is kind of still what men are trusting God for when they find, when they find a wife. And I just want to ask you wives, um, you know, when was the last time you said something, if you're married, when you, if you said something um, um, along the, the lines of to your husband, hey, you know what, I, I, I respect you, you know, I, I really look up to you, I honor you, um, you know, I, I trust your leadership. When, when was the last time you affirmed? Because submission is an, it's an attitude of the heart. And it's seen in the way it, we live, but it should also be expressed in the things that we say. Um, men love hearing, I love you. I mean, that's great. But man, it would, it would bless us as well if we, if we heard something along those lines as well. So I just want to encourage us uh, ladies to, to just really trust the Lord to grow in this area. I know we're all work in progress. And for you wives-to-be, uh, you know, begin to ask God to help you, to prepare you for the future um, uh, when this is going to be your, your situation if God blesses you with marriage. Verse 19, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. So he moves from wives, then he goes to husbands. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Husbands are to love their wives. We are leaders, but we are called to be loving leaders. Now, this would have been countercultural because the cultural emphasis at that time was more on how men were to rule over their wives, not so much on how men were to love their wives. And Craig Keener uh, makes this observation in commenting on this. He says, although it was assumed that husbands should love their wives, ancient household codes never list love as a husband's duty. Such codes told husbands only to make their wives submit. 
Now that's really interesting because God never tells us husbands to make our wives submit. God tells our wives directly himself that they should willingly submit. But he never says, hey, husbands, your job is to tell your wives to submit. That's not our job. Our job is to love our wives. And, and if you've ever tried to, hey, tell your wife, you're going to submit, I, I, I would imagine that the, the outcome of that wasn't probably the most pleasant because it's not your place. Your place is to love. She has something going with God where God is speaking to her and telling her willingly, you are to submit to the fellowship of your husband. So we are to love our wives. We should be patient with them. We should be kind to them. We should accept them as they are. We should treat them with understanding. We shouldn't easily get angry with them. And as I read this list, I'm like, I've blown it on each and every single one of these things numerous times. Lord, I need you. And, may, and maybe that's why uh, Paul starts with the wife, because he knows by the time he gets to the husband, the heat is really going to be turned on for us men. We should tell our wives regularly that we love them. Love is from the heart. It is seen in our actions. It is heard in our words as well. And, and wives will feel cherished if they are told, hey, you know what? I, I love you. And Paul gives insight into what this love should look like in Ephesians chapter 5. He's fairly brief here uh, writing to the Colossians. But writing to the Ephesians, he gives a little bit more, well, much more flesh to what this love should look like. He says, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Husbands, future husbands, that's the standard. Love your wives as what? Christ loved the church. Jesus gave himself for the church. The church is his body that he cares for. So our leadership is servant leadership. Our leadership is uh, putting ourselves low to see how best we can serve our wives. Our leadership is about our wives and pleasing them and, and ensuring that they are th they're doing well. And, and, and that's what it means. I was talking to a, to a fellow pastor uh, in South Africa earlier this week, and we were just talking about something he's written about um, um, husbands and wives and leadership in the church and so on. And, and he, he made a comment to me. He said, you know, for me, an indicator of how I am doing in my family is how, is how my wife is doing. If she's thriving, then I think I'm doing well as a husband. And I was really challenged because I thought he is actually saying that his whole desire, his heart is that his wife, and he mentioned his children as well, is that they would be thriving that they would be doing well. And, and that's kind of how he measured how he is doing as a husband. Martin Luther said this, the Christian is supposed to love his neighbor. And since his wife is his nearest neighbor, she should be his deepest love. The domineering kind of husband that lived in Paul's time would have used harshness as a way of showing his authority over his wife. And that's why Paul says, do not be harsh with your wives. Do not be harsh with them. And just like certain things can get in the way of wives submitting to their husbands, certain things can get in the way of husbands loving their wives. Again, bad experiences. If, if you've had bad experiences as a husband... Your, your whole attitude, your heart demeanor, your mind might be wired to say, you know what, I will never allow a woman to, to question me. I'm going to rule hard, I'm going to rule firm, because if you just give a space, then everything goes out the door. So you may have had some bad experiences and, and you've carried those into, into marriage and, and that, that, that causes you to be harsh. Causes, and you, don't re you may not even realize that this is going on, but there's something, there's a wound there that you have carried into your marriage that makes it difficult for you to be this loving, cherishing, empowering husband that Jesus wants you to be. It might be your upbringing. 
You saw how your father or um, another role model in your life, another male influencer in your life, how they related with, 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 with your mom or, or the, 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 the lady that raised you. And it's like, in that environment, there was none of this love business. You know, when, 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 when dad came home, everybody fled. Everybody was looking for somewhere to hide, for a corner. And it might sound a bit funny now, but then it was like, it was, it was terrible. It was, so you think, man, in my upbringing, I never saw this. I, I don't know what this looks like. I have a different worldview on this whole thing. Well, it might be your culture. Culture that says, you know what? Men are men. Got to be tough. They got to lay down the law. They got to show who's boss. They got to be heavy handed. That's what it means to be a man. Jesus, the greatest man who ever lived, he, he laid his life down. He went to the cross. He, he gave everything. That's, that's being a man. And, and that's the kind of man that we are called to be in marriage. But, but our culture may say something different and we're holding on to culture and and although we know what the bible says man culture sometimes trumps what the bible says it's like we we're more interested in in human tradition <laughs> colossians chapter 2 human teaching and tradition the ways of man pleasing man than we are in what the bible has to say and of course our sin we're sinful and sin makes us prideful. It, it makes us uh, not deal with anger properly. It makes us a uh, harsh sin. It's right there in every single one of us. And when we think of all these different things, it's like, man, no wonder we struggle to be this kind of husband. Husbands, when was the last time you, 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 you did something sacrificial? When was the last time you said to your wife, I really love you and, 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 and you meant it and you, and you cherished her? That's what your wife needs. She needs to be loved. And if husbands and wives lived this way with each other, we would have stronger, healthier marriages, stronger, healthier families. There would be less separation, less divorce. Churches would have greater impact for the kingdom of God. I mean, we could do some incredible things for God. But where the family is like struggling, it's weak, everything kind of is built from there, isn't it? And the whole thing just kind of doesn't have the strength and the momentum and the energy that it should. But God is able to heal, to restore, to strengthen us in these areas. Verse 20, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. There would have been nothing strange about this instruction. Children in that culture were expected to obey their parents. However, Paul points them to the reason why they should do so, because it pleases the Lord. It's not because there's a law that says, obey your parents. It's not because it was what the culture expected, and those are good reasons, but he gives them the best reason. He says, do it because it pleases Jesus. As a young person, if you are in Jesus, if you are a disciple of Jesus, if you are a follower of Jesus, then your goal in life is to please Jesus. Even before it is to please your mom and dad, it's to please Jesus. And as young people, I think Paul is onto something here because he, he identifies this pleasing thing. And as young people, um, we go through seasons in our lives where we're trying to figure out who are we supposed to please. Pleasing is a big deal for us. Am I supposed to please my friends? Am I supposed to please my teachers? Am I supposed to please my parents? Am I supposed to please my siblings? Am I supposed to please my boyfriend or my girlfriend? Am I supposed to please myself? I mean, after all, selfie generation, right? There's this thing about pleasing that confronts young people. And Paul says that 
Young people, children, your priority is to please the Lord. Live to please Jesus. One of the most challenging periods in, in my life was when I was between the age of 18 and 22. Um, as a younger teenager, I had been in a boarding school, a boarding school that was um, great education um, and great exposure to kind of international life. Um, a boarding school that was fairly liberal as well. So when I was there, we, we got away with so many things. Uh, and then I would go home uh, over the holidays and it's like, man, I have to be with parents and they're kind of cramping my style and then it's kind of back to school. And I did that for many years. And then between age of 18 and 22, I was actually living at home. And I was older, I was not actually a young man. And I was an undergraduate university student. And, and there was a real tension because now I'm getting older. I'd been so used to kind of having things my way. And now it's, well, mom and dad have got some rules and I need to live by those rules. And I, I caused my parents uh, a lot of headache. My parents had rules. They had certain things that they expected me to do. Rules about going out. Rules about relationships with girls. And I thought I knew better. And, and as I took things into my own hands, it came with consequences and sometimes very serious consequences. One day, uh, my, my parents sent me on an errand. Uh, I had learned how to drive. I hadn't been driving for long, but they felt, well, he can drive now so we can start sending him around. So they sent me on this errand. And in my mind, I already knew that I was going to do something other than just the errand. So I quickly did my errand, and then I drove up to my former school that I just mentioned, up the hill, because I wanted to go and check out the girls there. So I drove up the hill, and I spent a little bit of time, checked out some girls there, and then jumped back into my car, and I'm rushing home. Why? Two things. Well, I, I want to deceive my parents that I haven't done anything wrong. And I have disobeyed, okay? So as I'm rushing down the hill, I have an accident. And the car rolls. The car rolls, uh, the windscreen pops out. I mean, if you see that car, um, my, my dad had to take a, a fairly large loan to fix the car. Um, I had, by God's grace, uh, minor injuries compared to what the state of the car was. What happened there? It's a young person who didn't obey. A young person who decided, you know what? The wisdom of these old people, psh, I'm gonna do my own thing. And young people, I just wanna say to you that the safest place that you can be, even if that safe place seems boring, and even if that safe place seems hard, and by safe, I'm not saying safe because no one knows where I am and what I'm doing. That's not safe. I mean safe in the real sense of safe. Safety is to please Jesus. That's safe. Go about your life pleasing Jesus, which includes obeying your parents, and you will be safe. But what's the culture saying today? Because the culture of today is saying certain things to young people. The culture of today is saying, hey, young person, take your life into your own hands. It's saying, young person, if it feels good, it's okay. Young person, do what you want. You're empowered. And it's like authority and, and, and parents and, and, and other authorities, there's this clash. And, and our young people need to work that out. And it's hard, isn't it? But I want to just say to you young folks, these words of 2,000 years, which reflect the heart of an eternal God who created you, who created you to live for him, they are relevant to your life even today. And I just want to encourage you to live in the goodness of that. And you young people, just like us older people, you're also sinful. You've got sin in your hearts. You have rebellion in your hearts. That's why you struggle to obey. And maybe you've had harsh parents who've not treated you well. And it's hard to obey them. Or they've done things along the way where listening to your parents, obeying your parents, it's like, man, I, I don't want to hear what they have to say. Look at their lives. Look at what they've done. Well, it's, it's more about pleasing Jesus than it is about anything else. 
So you guys, you may also need to repent. You may also need to get healing for that pain where it's been hard to follow the leadership of your parents and where you've rebelled against what God has called you to do. And God will help you and God will bless your life. Amen. Our final verse is verse 21. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Paul singles out fathers. And, and he is speaking directly to fathers because he had just said parents and now he's fathers. Why? Because fathers were the primary authority in the home. However, what is said to fathers can be extended to mothers because we, we raise children together and, and, and in today's world, certainly uh, some fathers are raising kids on their own and some mothers are raising kids on their own. So this is applicable to all those contexts where you are a parent in any of those type of situations. But certainly the father has a unique role as an authority figure. The harsh type of leadership in the home was not only in the husband-wife relationship, it was also in the father-child relationship. Another translation of the Bible says, do not provoke your children. Do not provoke them. If we fathers, mothers too, if we speak harshly to our children, if we will embitter them. If we fathers, mothers as well, if we are harsh in the measures of discipline that we use on our children, we will embitter them. If we neglect our children, we will embitter them. And we can neglect them in, in different ways by being too busy to spend time with them. I remember last year, we, uh, one, one of my sons had a sporting event. And on that same weekend, we had planned a, I think it was either a church or a school function. I, I don't remember exactly. Um, and we were, you know, he was going to go. And, he, and my son's very gracious. He's like, no, dad, I understand. You can't make it. Uh, but I could see something wasn't right. Eventually, we decided to cancel the event and say, you know what? We can do it another time. So we went to the sports function and my son was so pleased. He was so happy. He was like, Dad, I'm so glad you did that. But he wouldn't have verbalized it because he's like, well, Dad's a pastor. He's busy. He's got to do his thing. But by saying, you know what? We, we need to spend time with you. That was the right call. Now, do we always get it right? Do I always get it right? No. I've, I've had my kids cry about, man, you were not there when, I, when you were supposed to be doing this and doing that. I've blown it. Absolutely, and I've had to say sorry and explain. I'm not standing here as one who gets it right the whole time. I mess up as well. But there is something about saying, you know what? How can we prioritize? How can we ensure that we are there for our children? Because neglect will embitter our children. Someone said this, many parents give their children everything except themselves. What our children need is us. We can embitter our children by not appreciating them for who they are. You should be like your brother. You should be like your sister. You should be like your cousin. Why aren't you more like them? Rather than, man, how did we start this passage? Giving thanks, right? Giving thanks. Rather than, man, I thank God for you. You are amazing. God created you. You are unique. And, and, and you have a plan and a purpose and just the way you are. God loves you and I love you. You are incredible. We should be the greatest encouragers of our children. You see, when we don't encourage, when we uh, neglect, when we embitter, when we uh, do those things, it, it moves from being embittered, provoked, to being discouraged. Children become discouraged. And that word discouraged carries a sense of being spiritless. It's like the, 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 the child's spirit is it's crushed. Spiritless children. And a child who carries the wounds of being embittered, the wounds of being discouraged, they will question themselves. And they will look for encouragement elsewhere. 
they will look for that affirmation elsewhere. And that could lead to all kinds of problems. I mean, fortunately, there's, there's, there's you know, many good role models out there that they could run to. But sometimes they, they end up in the wrong arms. And down a path that, man, if we were there encouraging and spurring on and affirming, they wouldn't be looking for that elsewhere. Our experience with our fathers, our experience with our culture, our experience with our own sinful nature, all of these things, again, can work together to make us parents that embitter our children and discourage our children. We look back at how we were raised and how maybe mom or dad was like, they were firm, they were strict, they were harsh. That's the way it's going to be in my family because that's the way it was and that's what worked. Or we, we, we want to kick against that. We want to do something different. But because we haven't had healing from those wounds and we're still carrying the pain, we, we find ourselves kind of repeating, perpetuating the cycle. Because we, although we know it wasn't right, we haven't brought it to Jesus who is enough and said, Jesus, please heal this. Jesus, please restore this. Jesus, I want to live a different legacy. But I can't do it on my own. I need you because you are enough. You are the one who is the healer of my soul. And I need you to come and restore me. So we need to repent and we need to say sorry sometimes to, to our own children. We need to say sorry to God. We need to receive healing for those wounds that were afflicted on us, that are causing us to live in a way that is not at the fullness of being in Christ. This is a topic that is quite, it's quite close to the heart and it's, and I think sometimes we can just brush it aside and say, you know what, that's for someone else. But I, I believe there are people here this morning that are carrying hurt and disappointment with parents and spouses, even children. And, and God wants to restore and reconcile. He wants to heal. And what we've looked at today starts with being in Christ. It starts with putting your faith in Jesus. It starts with recognizing that although others may have sinned against you, you are also a sinner who needs the goodness of Jesus Christ. You need his grace. It starts with that. And if you haven't done that, if you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus, if you haven't said, Jesus, I want to say you are enough for this area, for my family, for the history that I have, and you're enough for it, I invite you to do that this morning. Just to invite Jesus into your heart and say, Jesus, today you are Lord of my life. I give my life to you. I surrender. We sang about surrendering. I truly surrender to you today. And I ask you to come and heal these areas of my life. So I'd like us to end by praying. As these guys lead us in a song, shall we stand together? And if you would like to be prayed for in line with what we have seen from God's word this morning, I want to invite you to come to the front so we can pray for you. Because Jesus is God and because Jesus is powerful, he can do something great in your life as we pray. So I want to ask you to take a step of humility as well as a step of faith and come to the front so that we can pray. As you do that, I'm going to pray for us first and you can be coming forward so we can pray for you. 
Lord Jesus, thank you for every person here this morning, whether they are a husband or a wife or a father or a mother or a child. Lord Jesus, thank you that you see them. Thank you that you care for them. Thank you that you are the one who binds up the brokenhearted. Thank you that you are the one who restores and reconciles. Thank you that you are our healer. And Lord, this morning, we are trusting you for healing, for healing, God. Healing in the innermost place. Healing for things that may have happened 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, five years ago, six years ago, three months ago. Lord, you are outside of time. You were there before time. Time does not constrain you. So Lord, we ask that today you would do a mighty work. Thank you that you are a loving father. Thank you that you are a good father. You are a father who looks at us with compassion and grace. Thank you that you never make a mistake. Thank you that you haven't made a mistake with any one of these men and women, any one of these people up here. You love them. You created them. They have a purpose in you. They have a destiny in you, God. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you for these dear friends up here. God, you know their pain. God, you know the things that have been said to them. God, you know the things that have been done to them. God, you know the wounds that they carry. God, I pray. I pray that you would heal them, Lord. I pray that you would restore them, God. Lord, your word says that as we have been forgiven in Christ, we too should forgive. Lord, where they need to forgive, God, would you help them to forgive? Where they need to forgive, help them to forgive, not in their own strength, but because of the gospel, because of the forgiveness that they have received. Lord, where they need to repent of sin in their own lives, where they've not done well as children or as husbands or fathers or parents Lord help them to turn away from sinful ways to turn away from the traditions of man to turn away from the culture of our day and to say I'm going to live according to the Bible I'm going to live according to the word of God even if it's going to cost me something even if it means I need to surrender that area of my life God I pray that you would give them strength Holy Spirit that you would give them strength to turn away and to follow you fully in the name of Jesus Lord I pray that they will write a new chapter a chapter that is different from previous chapters, the previous chapters of their families. Lord, a different story will be told, a different story of redemption, of healing, of love, of grace, of compassion, of forgiveness, of worth, of joy and peace and love. Lord, a story that is a reflection of what the cross of Jesus Christ has done because the cross of Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough for every single one of them. So Lord, heal hearts today, heal minds today, bind up broken hearts today in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.